Hi, this is Dr. Mark Hyman, Director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, and welcome to our Q&A with Dr. David Ludwig from Harvard Medical School, Children's Hospital, and one of the leading researchers in metabolism, insulin resistance, and our understanding of weight and weight regulation. He's been my hero, one of the pioneers in understanding the phenomena of the glycemic load, glycemic index, and how that affects weight. So welcome to Cleveland, Dr. David Ludwig. Thank you. Great to be here. So uh, we just uh, got to hear your grand rounds on overeating causing obesity or obesity causing overeating, which is sort of a paradigm shifting view uh, that challenges the whole calories in, calories out hypothesis, which we've all learned, which is that if you eat more and exercise less, you're going to gain weight. And if you want to lose weight, you should eat less and exercise more. It sounds it's, pretty simple, doesn't seems it? Seems like yeah. a very straightforward why math isn't it, Why isn't it working? <laughs> it's not working, no. And you know, like why aren't we out of a job? We should be, right? If it was so easy, right? If everybody did it. But you know, the the thing that I've learned from you over the last you know decade and a half or more is that, and it was really from your first study looking at these children who were overweight, who were given three different diets of same calories. One was a high glycemic diet of oatmeal, and there was an intermediate diet of steel cut oats, and a low glycemic diet of an omelet. And even though they were the same calories, the kids who ate the omelet, ate 81% less food, were less hungry, had lower levels of insulin, glucose, and adrenaline, and cortisol, than the ones who had the high glycemic diet. And that just was an explosion in my mind back in the, probably 1999 when you did the study. And it really was started me on this path of thinking about this. And you've just taken it much, much farther. So, you know, one of the challenges is that the prevailing paradigm is so strong. And there's a couple of studies recently I want to dig into, um, dig in with you about, uh, that were done by Dr. Kevin Hall from the NIH, who's a really extraordinary man, a uh, researcher who's focused on looking at mathematics analyzing metabolism. And the first study was looking at a controlled metabolic ward, looking at a very low fat diet or a very low carb diet and how that affected calorie burning and metabolism. And his conclusion was that the low fat diet did better. That was the headline. And the subsequent study is the Biggest Loser study, where he looked at the participants in the Biggest Loser study uh, show, and he measured their metabolisms before and after the Biggest Loser, and then a year later to see what happened to them. And it seems universally they gained back the weight and even more, and then even worse, their metabolism was slower at the end of the study when they'd gained back the weight, which was kind of depressing, leaving everybody with the message that weight loss is hopeless, that you're going to gain back the weight, and your metabolism is damaged, and there's no way to fix that. So could you kind of dig into your thinking about that? Because I know you've written a lot about it. There's an article on uh, Medium about your response to this. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's start with the biggest loser study. So the uh, study was published in the journal Obesity, and then linked to a New York Times uh, article that got international attention and presented a pretty bleak picture. They now note that this is an observational study and a very limited one. In fact, they just followed uh, a small number of like biggest a dozen losers people or so. you know, over a few years and found that even the most successful of the biggest losers on TV struggled incessantly with hunger and uh, experienced a slowdown in their metabolism years later. So increasing hunger, slowing metabolism, which is the body's evidence of pushing back against weight gain. Mm -hmm. Many of them, most of them regained much of their lost weight. And so on the surface of it, that's a, a bleak picture. That if even the biggest losers, yeah. extremely disciplined, you know, uh, a small set of the most motivated among us can't do it. What hope is there for the rest of us? Yeah, so I just give it up. <laughs> so I think that's, um, that's just half the st study, uh, story. Now, it's an important half, which I think gets neglected in our current calorie in, calorie out mm -hmm, mindset, mm -hmm. which is that you can't just cut back calories and ask people to stick to that naively without considering biology, mm -hmm. the body's responses. So if you take people who are heavy, they're probably they're, they're overeating typically, and why? Right. Usually, there's a lot of reasons to overeat, but one of the main reasons is they're hungry. They have hung, they're hungry. And if you cut back calories, what happens to hunger? Goes up. Mm -hmm. So what are we supposed to do 
for the rest of our lives. Just ignore that and live with perpetual hunger. So uh, if Jillian Michaels is yelling at you all the yeah. time, you may then you be might able, able to do, do it. it temporarily. But <laughs> or if you're living you know, in an extremely restrictive environment, you know, you're a peasant on a uh, you know, rural village in China working 14 or 16 hours a day, there isn't much food, you're not going to get obese. But th th you're not going to be feeling good. And that's certainly not a good model for what happens in the United States. So, the, but the point that was missed in the yeah. Biggest Loser study is that, um, yes, the body fights back, but this, um, this body weight set point that we're fighting back against isn't set in stone. Yeah. Well, you know, just, to, just to pause there for a minute. You know, the, when people say the body's got a set point that it goes back to, it misses the point that 150 years ago, there wasn't all these obese people walking around, and they had a different set point. So how does that set point well, change well, that's, for that's, humans yeah. you know, in a, just a, a yeah. one century? Yeah, well, that's, that's the point, uh, that uh, 30, 40 years ago, we were fighting to defend a set point that was 30, 35 pounds lighter than it is today. So what's causing us to be defending this higher set point today compared to 30 mm -hmm. years ago? And, um, but by implication, there are things that we can do um, with our diet to alter that set point. And one area that I've been exploring for most of my career is the possibility that the processed carbohydrates, not just sugar, but white bread, white rice, prepared breakfast cereals, low-fat cookies, crackers, chips, uh, even the all starchy these potatoes, right? Well, yeah, even the white not, russet potato, which not is the not the Peruvian, you not know, the little purple potatoes, right. Peruvian potato, but it's been hybridized to make the perfect yeah. French fry. It digests into sugar in minutes after eating. Mm -hmm. So that these, what they're doing, is raising levels of the hormone insulin too mm -hmm. fast and too high. Mm -hmm. You know, I call insulin the miracle grow for your fat cells, yeah. just not the sort of miracle you want happening in your body. No. We know this, this is endocrinology 101. If you give somebody too much insulin and someone with diabetes too much insulin, they predictably gain weight. Mm -hmm. A child with type one diabetes who can't make enough insulin will predictably lose weight until, until coming to treatment, getting yeah. adequate. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, you can eat 10,000 calories a day as a type one diabetic <laughs> before you get on insulin and you lose weight so insulin is what's driving most of the accumulation of fat. Well, it's a key player. And if you don't have diabetes and you're not getting insulin injected, the fastest way to change the amount of insulin in your body is the amount and type of carbohydrates you eat. Uh -huh. um, but other aspects of the diet beyond carbohydrate also affect that. But it leads to the possibility that our primary approach to obesity treatment the last 40 years, the low-fat diet that has endorsed all manner of processed carbohydrates beyond just you know, fruits and vegetables, which many of us you know, are accepting are healthy, but all of these, but that's not the debate. You can eat lots of fruits and vegetables and a lot of fat, mm -hmm. but if you start decreasing your fat intake, it becomes very hard not to be increasing the processed carbs. And that that campaign that was launched 40 years ago, the low fat diet, as uh, embodied by the first food guide pyramid of 1992, may have uh, you know, unhappily contributed, not mm -hmm. prevented, the obesity epidemic. But there, but there are those who say, well, we've reduced our total fat from 40 to 30% of calories, but we've increased our total calories and increased our total consumption of food. And so what do you say to the naysayers who are focusing on that we haven't actually been eating low fat enough, that we should be eating more like 10 or well, 20% it's, it, fat. It's true that we uh, decreased fat as a proportion, as we were told. And as that happened, the calories in our diet, our total calorie consumption went up. But these aren't true, true, and unrelated. Uh -huh. They're true, true, and related. In other words, why are we eating more? Well, it may be that as you substitute processed carbohydrates for fat, you trigger biological changes that are driving fat storage, leading us to be hungrier and gaining weight. And, uh -huh. that and there's not a shred of evidence that a continued focus on fat reduction. So it was, uh -huh. you know, 40 years ago, they were just saying, well, get fat below, get it to around 30% and we'll be fine. Uh -huh. So now that we're at about 30%, the argument is, oh, well, we really should have gone lower, 20%, 10%. You know, there's just no precedent. There's, there's no evidence for that. And the, you know, it may be that some people 
could do perfectly well on a 20% fat diet. I'm not arguing that everybody should be eating high fat, but there's no evidence on a population basis that a continued focus on fat reduction is helpful. helpful. And in fact, there's a, a lot of evidence that it is hurtful. The highest uh, nutrition quality foods today, uh -huh. um, the top of the list for protection against diabetes, heart disease, maybe even neurodegenerative diseases, are among the highest fat, most calorie dense foods in yeah, existence. Which just sort of blows up the whole Nuts. idea that we should be eating low fat because it has less calories. Yeah. And that now you're saying we actually, your always hungry program is, starts out at 50% fat, which seems like total heresy in the nutrition community. Not, any, not, not heresy <laughs> anymore. I mean, there's enough people who are you know, recognizing that uh, you know, the low fat diet was sort of a 40 year folly. Mm. But unfortunately, the consequences, the nutritional establishment has not really embraced mm -hmm. uh, the fact that this was a public health mistake. No. And the bar keeps shifting a bit. You know, uh, well, let's get fat down to 30% and we'll automatically lose weight. And then when these diets of higher fat diets came out showing more weight loss, initially the response was, all right, maybe you can lose more weight on a high fat diet, but you'll be a good looking corpse. Remember right, right, argument? you can lose weight with chemotherapy, but that doesn't yeah. make it good, right? You know, you know, <laughs> you, you know, you'll die of heart disease. And then when it turns out, like with a Predimid study came out, mm -hmm. that they had to stop early because heart disease rates dropped so fast in the high fat groups. Now the argument was, oh, well, maybe a high fat diet is okay, but a low fat diet would be even better if you got it down to 15 or 10%. That's but right. you know, the bar keeps moving. Well, well what's, what your arguments are- And, and are... The, the key point here is that public health, the public uh, remains um, focused on fat reduction because yeah. there hasn't been a clear recognition of mm -hmm. its failures and public health policy right. remains um, mired in the low-fat paradigm. Today, as a child, a 10-year-old kid can go to school and get fat-free milk loaded with sugar. Yeah. It's called chocolate milk. Yeah. But he's prevented by regulation from getting whole unsweetened whole plain whole milk. Yeah. So this is um, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And it is an evidence of uh, the fact that we haven't really done a proper accounting mm -hmm. of uh, the biggest public health experiment ever conducted. Well, well you know, David, the what's, fat diet. What's so, what's so we, we have to learn these lessons. It's, you know, we did, you know, let's learn these met lessons and move forward. Let's not try to obscure uh, what had happened by shifting the, you know, the goalposts. Well, it's so, it's so extraordinary about your work because it sort of answers that in a quite a, a rigorous way by looking at the biology of obesity in ways that many others haven't. And some of the most compelling things you talked about in your recent Grand Rounds here was that when you looked at, for example, animal studies <clears throat> and even human studies, when you kept calories the same, you saw profound shifts in metabolism. You saw in the very low fat group, they actually burned far less calories, about 300 less calories a day than a high fat group of 60% fat, even on an yeah. isocaloric diet. And, yeah. and the other study that was sort of fascinating was an animal study, which is limitations, but when you restricted the carbohydrates, the animals started to lose weight. Yeah. <laughs> so you had to increase their calories. Yeah. And yeah. despite the increase in calories, the group that had the group that had the low fat diet actually lost muscle and they gain more fat even though they ate less calories, which is kind of stunning. And not only that, what you found was that the phenomena that triggered all this was that insulin went up first before they started overeating. It was preceding everything. So that's really profound. And that actually explains the biology of why our metabolism slows down on a low fat diet, why it speeds up on a high fat diet, and, and what happens to our muscle mass. So it's this whole cascade of biology. It's not just a sort of an abstract theory around weight. This is something you've really dug into. So maybe we can pick up first with uh, the question that you asked earlier about yeah. whole stuff. Yeah, because so, that's, that's right, explain so, and that. Then we can, because that was a, yeah. looking at a low-fat diet and it was interpreted, he actually did two studies. I'm not speaking of the observational 
Biggest Loser study that we already yeah. talked about. He did two uh, metabolic ward studies. Metabolic ward studies. One was a six day study. Mm -hmm. So the arms were of six days, low fat or a higher fat. Very long trial. Six days. Yeah, that was long. Yeah. Six days. And um, <laughs> the other was a non-randomized, um, it got a lot of attention. He did a YouTube video, uh, but it actually hasn't been uh, published yet published. as of this point. Um, and that was a non-randomized study a month at a time on a low fat, on a sort of a standard American diet or a very high fat ketogenic diet. You know, both of these studies have you know, they're, they're fine studies, but they have major limitations, which completely preclude uh, testing the hypotheses we're discussing. So, so it was the wrong study designed to answer the question. Well, well let, me, let me just comment. So first of all, you take an American public that's insulin resistant, eating a high carbohydrate diet, um, and you put them on a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, it's going to take a while to metabolically adapt to that. Mm -hmm. you know, I think Paul... Uh, tends to dismiss that, but there's clear evidence for that effect in the literature mm -hmm. and in his very own studies. Mm -hmm. uh, in the one-month study mm -hmm. um, that he did, uh, first of all, it was non-randomized, and it was biased to favor the standard American diet. It came first. And uh, remember, people were put in a metabolic ward for a month and then a second month. So we know that when you're in a ward, first of all, you're not moving around as much, you're not working out and such, your lean mass is gonna slowly deteriorate. Sure. Right. They also didn't get the calories right, so their weight progressively declined. So you start that high fat diet in a much worse metabolic state. So your lower metabolism and your- You've got lower weight, probably less muscle, and despite that, they still had a faster metabolic rate, 150 calories a day. Now, Hall argued that that, you know, wasn't big enough, we really should have seen more, but Just first ignore of all, the man behind the curtain kind well, of thing? Well, first of all, 150 <laughs> calories by his, so own, by his own calculations, Yeah, 150 calorie gap, an energy gap, is the whole obesity epidemic. It's a he lot. He published this, and he was correct about that in Lancet, so why that would be dismissed that way, but that 150 calories could have been 300 or 400 calories if you take into account the weight loss effects, right. The losing. So he set it up to tissue. fail, but it still succeeded. Well, no, I'm not saying there was any poor intention in the design, but it was by design a pilot study. Yeah. And so a pilot study is used to inform a definitive study. You can't take a pilot study and dismiss a hypothesis like the insulin carbohydrate hypothesis. But actually, a fair interpretation of it, as I wrote on my Medium platform, is that it's actually strong support. Now, the last thing I want to say is if you look at fat oxidation. And I'd encourage anybody who wants to understand this more, go read David's article on Medium about yeah, just his response. David Ludwig, MD, on, on medium.com. Medium. Yeah. It's a blog platform. Yeah, and uh, you can follow me, David Ludwig, MD, on Twitter or Facebook. Um, and buy his book. <laughs> what's the name of the book? Always Hungry. Okay. Uh, Why would you buy a book that makes you always hungry, though? I don't understand that. Well, that's the subtitle. <laughs> Conquer cravings, oh, retrain that. your okay. fat cells, and lose weight. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you look at the poster that Hall presented, mm -hmm. you can see um, what's happening to fat oxidation on both of the diets. Now, yeah. he, you, you, start losing, you, you're, you're, you start losing body fat with the calorie restriction that he inadvertently had on the standard American diet. Mm -hmm. When he shifted to the ketogenic high-fat diet, yes, fat oxidation temporarily slowed down because the body isn't used to burning fat. Yeah. It takes a while to adapt, and that decreased. But if you look at the second two weeks, you can see that there's an acceleration. Yeah. So what's going to, so if you, you know. It takes about like two or three weeks to adapt, right? Well, it might, for some people, it might take a few months. Yeah. So what the key is, what's going to happen after two, three, four months? We're mm -hmm. in the midst of a big mm -hmm. clinical trial of 150 people, each studied for a full academic year. So we hope to have. And this is like a $12 million study, right? Yes. Where you're looking at trying to definitively answer this yeah. question is a calorie a calorie? Yeah. Right. We hope to you know, have results uh, in about a year and, you know, in uh, late 2017. Mm -hmm. um, so ultimately, we need definitive data. M research from my group has suggested that after a month 
on a higher fat, on a high fat diet, um, using stable isotopes to look at total energy expenditure. Uh, you can see a significant metabolic advantage uh -huh. to a high fat diet. We, ours, what we saw was about 325 calories a day. Uh -huh. Now, um, I'm not proposing that that's the final answer, uh -huh. definitive. It doesn't you know, prove anything, but it provides a strong basis for thinking that the type of calories you have eat could affect the number of calories you burn in ways that have everything to do with the prospects of long-term successful weight loss management. Now we This is called line, the insulin carbohydrate theory or the hormonal hypothesis. Yeah, or the fat cell as opposed theory to the obesity. energy the energy. This hypothesis. way of thinking is that overeating is a consequence, not the cause of obesity. So that and, and how do you a simple experiment, you know? Mm -hmm. You could do this yourself, or you could look at the literature. It's been done dozens of times. Take people at whatever their usual weight is. Mm -hmm. Lean for a guy like you, you know, or in the obese category for someone else. And then force feed them. You, know, you do this voluntary, you, you pay them, and people volunteer for this sort of thing. You force the, eat a lot. <laughs> you force feed them, and people think this is going to be a great study because they talk about all these delicious foods. And you know, for the first day or two, people might be enjoying them so, mm -hmm. themselves, but they start gaining weight. Yeah. And their body starts to push back, and they s start feeling miserable. Yeah. They, they don't want to be eating 1,000 calories too much. Mm -hmm. They lose all interest in food. Their metabolism speeds up in their body's attempt to get rid of the calories. And at the end of the force-feeding study, they're delighted. They eat less, and their weight comes right back down to where you started. Mm -hmm. So yes, overeating can, in the acute, in acute setting, cause some weight gain, but we're arguing that that's not what's driving the obesity ed epidemic. Mm -hmm. We've had cause and effect mixed up. Mm -hmm. The basic problem is our fat cells are triggered to suck in and store too many calories by the high insulin that's mm -hmm. produced on our high carb diet. They feast, the rest of the body starves. Mm -hmm. The brain sees that there aren't enough calories in the blood mm -hmm. and that's why we get hungry. Yeah. The body goes into starvation mode. And if you simply so you're cut basically back, starving even while you're obese. It seems like your body perceives that you're starving. That's right. It's, there's plenty of calories, too many calories in the fat cells, but that's not what the brain sees. But it initially sees, when they eat, there's a ton of calories in the bloodstream, yep. right? But then it kind of crashes because well, of the high Well, that's right. Insulin. So if you eat the bagel, fat-free cream cheese, and orange juice, you're good for the next hour. Mm -hmm. You feel great. That's why you eat it. But so, it's what happens three, four hours later. Those calories get excessively deposited in fat cells, your brain says, we've got a problem, Houston. Um, bring in reinforcements in the form of usually more processed carbs, and you, you overeat on them, mm. you feel good again for the next hour or two, and then you're back where you started a few hours later. What's that, if, if that involved any other substance, we'd call it an addiction. Right, so, so going back to the biggest loser study, you know, these people had impaired metabolism at the end of the study. And, and is there a hope for fixing that metabolism? You see these people yo-yo diets, they go up and down, you often lose muscle and fat. When you lose weight, you gain back often mostly fat, so your metabolism will actually slower. That's exactly what we showed, yeah. at least you know, in a preliminary sense, in the studies that you've cited. So that we, when um, somebody was weight reduced, so we re weight reduced people, we fed them everything, that we knew what they were eating, fed them everything that they consumed for seven months. This was published in JAMA 2012. Yeah. Uh, first author is, and the study director was Kara Ebling, yeah. uh, my research partner. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, uh, we showed that this metabolic rate plummeted with weight loss on a standard high carb, low fat diet, but that on a low carb, high fat diet, metabolism didn't slow down at all with weight loss. It was uh -huh. like the body didn't know it had lost weight. Uh -huh. That's going to be, you know, that if we can change, if those biggest losers had that 325 calorie metabolic advantage, so, that so would you're, solve their so problem. So you're assuming that they might have actually been eating a low-fat diet in a continued attempt to lose weight, which is why they couldn't maintain it and then gain back the weight. Well, what have what have 95 percent of the population? who have been trying to control their weight over the last 40 years, been mm -hmm. eating. Low-fat diets, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly been interest in Atkins and other ex diets, but most people, to this very day, according mm -hmm. to a Google 
uh, poll, more people, most, most people who are trying to control weight are still focused on fat reduction. So you're saying if these... And that's not surprising, given that we were told to do that for 40 years, we were told, if you don't want fat on your body, don't put fat into your body. And so that 60% fat diet that you use, that speeded up metabolism, and you think that would offset this that's negative the whole effect? Story. If, that's, if that 325 calorie advantage is real, that's the whole ob. That's more than the whole obesity mm. epidemic. No, that is the whole obesity epidemic. Without postulating a change in food intake. And of course, does it matter what kind of fat? You know, just as uh, carbohydrates. So I'm not making the argument that we should give up all carbohydrates. And there are many that are delicious, nutritious, and can be tolerated by most people. Now, if you've got the ultimate metabolic meltdown, type two diabetes, which is by definition carbohydrate intolerance we may want to be thinking about even limiting things like fruit. But for most people, whole fruit looks really good, you know, metabolically, you know, in the studies that, that exist. Um, and they differ from the processed carbohydrates. And in the same sense, we know fat differs in its metabolic effects. Um, trans fats, of course, are the closest thing to poison in the food supply. Happily, they're on their way out. Um, Saturated fat, in my opinion, you know, is not public health enemy number one, but that doesn't mean we want to bathe in butter either. Well, it's not um, a health food, but it's not the enemy. That's right. If you over-focus on getting rid of saturated fat, you get rid of a whole bunch of healthy foods, like real dark chocolate. Well, I found stunning when I was reviewing fats that, that breast milk is, by calories, 25% saturated fat. It's the most abundant fat in breast milk, which yeah. makes you wonder why... We were designed to feed healthy babies with all this saturated fat if it was so bad for us, <laughs> you know. And what about uh, vegetable oils? Because I think there's been a large push, especially from a lot of colleagues at Harvard, of, of eating more vegetable oils or polyunsaturated fatty acids as a protective mechanism. And yet there's been this new trial that was a randomized controlled trial that was data buried for 40 years that showed saturated fat versus vegetable oil. The saturated fat actually did better. The vegetable oil, even though they lowered the LDL more, they had more heart attacks yeah. and deaths, even though it was verified by autopsy so and weight studies. So there are two studies that have come out by the same group of uh, rediscovered data um, mm -hmm. that weren't fully published. One involved the Sydney study and the other mm -hmm. from Minnesota. And you know, these are interesting studies. They provide you know, some, some data. Neither of these studies are definitive. Um, the vegetable oils that they used during this time, mm -hmm. remember this is the 60s and 70s, would have likely been loaded with trans fats. Although and the corn oil study, I don't think. No, no we, you know, there's, there was likely to have been trans fats. Now the mm -hmm. authors make an argument where they uh, argue that, uh, the, the, an argument that uh, that was probably not a definitive factor there, but I, I don't think the effects of both total trans fats and specifically the types of trans fats mm -hmm. can be known. Unfortunately, yeah. we just don't know. Yeah. And so clearly everybody recognizes the trans fat. If you, if you trans increase fat. trans fats, you're thinking you're increasing, decreasing saturated fat, but what you're really doing is increasing trans fats. We all acknowledge that's, that that's, that's a bad idea. Yeah. Um, the other concern about the study is that there was such a, uh, an aggressive replacement of uh, all oils with these omega-6 plant oils, that they've succeeded in reducing an already low intake of omega-3. Yeah. And we know omega-3 is critical. Yeah. So um, if you push omega-3s artificially down by just flooding plant oils everywhere, that could be a problem too. Now, um, the epidemio in the epidemiology, plant oils look good. Uh -huh. People have but they often are con combining omega-3 and omega-6 in those studies so that actually you can't yeah. decipher the effect. Because yeah. if you add omega-3s, it's sort of, yeah. sort of a counterweight to excess omega-6s. Yeah, so you know, this is a really controversial Con area as to whether there is a, an optimal ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, which you know, it's hard to see in the epidemiology is the case. But um, there's some... Mechan there's, there's theoretical arguments. Omega sixes are a little, you know, uh, tend to go along the inflammatory pathway. Uh -huh. like, there's no question that of the two, we're under-consuming omega threes yeah. uh, to a much greater extent 
than omega-6s. Right. And as to what the optimal amount of all of these, omega-6s and 3s are required, um, but the approach that we take is not to banish saturated fat, although we uh, encourage a range of unsaturated fats. We like them to be as unprocessed as possible. Like and, mono, unsaturated olive you know, oil, olive oil, avocado, nuts but, and seeds. But whole nuts and seeds, and it's going to give a range of fats plus other benefits. And I think that uh, so get your fats from whole foods. Yeah, well, olive oil is technically not a whole food, but you know, real olive oil, you know, is green because it's just this slurry of antioxidants. Right. And so. Well, David, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you for joining us at Cleveland Clinic All right. and uh, sharing your wisdom with us. And I think what's really even more exciting is the studies yet to come that we've been talking about, the ones you're doing, and answering these questions that will hopefully flip the paradigm, not just for a few of us paying attention, but for the rest of the country and help us solve this obesity epidemic. So thank you so much Pleasure. for joining us. Yeah.